All right. <clears throat> Amen. Psalm chapter number 26. Look at verse number 5. Psalm 26, 5 says, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. The title of the sermon this evening is The Opposite of Love. The Opposite of Love. I figured since uh, you know it's February, everybody's talking about Valentine's Day and Valentine's Day happens to fall on Sunday this year. Uh, you know, I have a sermon all ready to go for that. And uh, I, I think it'll be a blessing, but uh, you know, all too often in this world, we don't hear about the opposite of love, right? We're told to, that, you know, hate is such a, a bad and a terrible thing. But the problem is hate is something that we all experience. It's an emotion that we have, and we have to learn how to properly manage hate, especially as God's people. Now, you just read this entire psalm here, and it's funny how he says, I have hated the congregation of evildoers, like it's a good thing, right? I think if you were to take this verse and just go out on the street and say, just, just read it without saying it's a Bible verse, and say, you know, who do you think said this? Do you think this was Allah, or do you think this was David? I have a feeling that a lot of people say, oh, that's, that's probably a Muslim. That's all I said. That's, that's out of the Quran, you know? <laughs> that's what they would say. Um, and then obviously it's because... Today, hate is something that uh, is, is preached against in most churches. It's, uh, it's demonized, if you will. And a lot of times what these people will do is they will take hate and they attach it to violence, right? That's usually synonymous. I was looking up uh, New Evangelical Sermons on hate before I was writing this. It was just getting me upset. You know, it was just like, you know, uh, all people who hate, you know, Jesus told us not to commit violence, not to you know, do uh, <clears throat> terrible things to people. And it's like, well, that's obvious. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. It's, it's almost like you shouldn't even need to, to bring that up. But what they're doing is they don't understand how this subject plays out in the Bible. And so what they do to get a sermon across, they just attach it to violence every single time and say, well, if you hate, then you've committed violence. You've murdered your brother. You've, you know, you, you're ba you've lost your salvation or you were never saved to begin with or something along those lines. And that's totally not true. Um, you can leave your place there, but go to Proverbs chapter number 13. Proverbs chapter number 13. When I was a kid, um, I can remember this all growing up. My mom would always say, Joseph, you're not supposed to hate anybody for any reason. You're not supposed to hate anything. She would always say that because I'd, you know, come, from, come home from school and say, oh, you know, I hate these kids or whatever. I hate this person. And she's like, you're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to say that. And um, I can remember specifically when I learned uh, who and what exactly the alphabet people were. I was like, man, that's nasty. I hate those people. And she's like, you know, we know a lot of those people and they're great. You should never hate them at all. And she would even tell me, you know, the Bible is against that because my mom was Catholic, you know, for most of her life. And, you know, the Pope is against hate and all this stuff. And it just never sat right with me. And I, you know, praise God, because I got saved at a young age, I believe it was the Holy Spirit saying, you know, hold on to that phrase, but don't believe it because it's definitely not true. Now, look at verse number five. So you're there in Proverbs chapter 13. Look at verse number five. It says, A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. And so some people would say, well, I don't have a problem with hating evil, right? They'll say, you got to hate the sin and love the sinner. The problem with that is, as many of you know, that's not in the Bible. That's a quote from Gandhi. You know, so they'll say, well, yeah, we, 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 we agree with that. You know, a righteous man should hate lying and we should all hate lying. And, you know, I agree. It's just what the Bible says. But, you know, they would never agree with the rest of this verse, which says, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. What does it mean to loathe? It's a synonym for hate, like a bore, strongly dislike, um, repulsive. So the Bible is saying that wicked people are what? Loathsome, meaning that they are a walking <laughs> uh, dispenser of hate, basically. Wicked people, as you know, their actions, their verbiage, and everything that they stand for is loathsome. You go to the workplace and you work with wicked people, or you go to the store and you, you hear how some of these wicked people talk, and it's just a shame. It's disgusting. It's despicable. It causes you to hate is what it does. But what does that mean? Does that mean that now I'm going to go ahead and commit an act of violence? No. Look, I've said this for years. I hate mayonnaise, but I have never gone up and blown up a, a mayonnaise factory. I've never even really had that thought. 
right? If you like mayonnaise, that's your business. You know, <laughs> go ahead and eat it. I hate it, right? I have that right. And you know what? I've hated it for 40 years. And guess what? I have committed zero acts of violence towards people who eat mayonnaise or people who manufacture it. So, I mean, there you go. That should be proof enough, right? <laughs> now, you can leave your place there and go back in your Bible to Leviticus chapter number 20. Leviticus chapter number 20. And so, you know, you read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and it talks about a time for all of these different things that we experience in life, uh, like a time to love. It says a time, for, uh, a time to hate. There's a time for war, and there's a time for peace. You know, there's a time for everything under the sun. And the reason why that's laid out in the Bible is to teach us the, the truth, which is you cannot have love unless you have hate, right? right? You cannot love your children unless you hate those who would want to harm them. Because yeah, if you say, well, I love them too, and I want to see them be saved, that's ignorant. That's a very ignorant statement. Basically, what you're saying is, I don't love my children. Because what happens when the wicked one comes and snatches your child from you? Are you going to wish them blessings? Hey, hope you take good care of them, you know. I hope you get saved. Nobody in their right mind would say something like this. And you know darn well that even a heathen who doesn't believe the Bible hates pedophiles. Amen. Most of them do, right? Even the ones who are like, you know what, I just don't want to go to church. I don't, I don't care what it says. You go ahead and snatch their kids, and they're going to hate your guts, right? But they'll be the first ones to tell you, well, you know what's wrong with the world? There's too many people causing too many problems, and there's too much hate. Hate's behind all the wars, <laughs> right? That's, that's what they'll say. But the question is, is that true? Is that what the Bible teaches? Now, Leviticus chapter number 20. So uh, this circle is obviously very familiar with this chapter. You know darn well what's in here. But with those things in mind, right? Leviticus 20, 13, all the different sins in here about bestiality and just in sexual in nature, right? You're going to read about those sins in this chapter. But look at verse 23 for a moment. Look what it says here. So God's explaining that, hey, I'm, I'm allowing you to remove these pagan, wicked nations from where they currently reside because they do all of these things. Look at verse 23. It says this, And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. That word there, therefore, means because they have done all these things. Right? So what God is saying is because these pagans, because these heathens hate my guts because they act so wickedly. You know, a lot of these people were probably obviously reprobate doing a lot of this stuff. And God's saying, hey, I'm going to allow you to conquer them. I want you to kick them out and I don't want you to ever act like they act. He says, I abhorred them. You know what that means? That means that God hated those people. And some people would, t would dare to say today, well, you know what? Jesus came and he changed the law. He changed all of that. Well, then why do we have the book of Revelation? Right. Why is he going to one day allow hell to come to this earth and torment the wicked if he's changed his mind? Because guess what? The Bible says that the end times what are, are going to be exactly like it was in the days of Noah. And you will find all of these things going on in the days of Noah. If you really study the subject out, you're starting to see those things play out today. In fact, we have this uh, pedophile president who's signing all these crazy executive orders, allowing trannies to compete in whatever gender they want to, right? I read an article yesterday. It was like, oh, these two sprinters just smoked the women's division. You know, <laughs> I mean, think about that. That's the direction that this nation is headed and this nation leads the world. So where do you think the world is headed? Straight to hell. That's where it's headed. And for somebody to get up behind a pulpit and preach that we need to love those people, that we need to respect the way that they act and the way that they operate, that is vast ignorance. And you know what? That needs to be stopped. That needs to be dealt with. People, oh, you're a hate church, always talking about hate. Yeah, because you won't talk about it. Right. You know what? That's, be, that's why we have to mention this stuff often, because it's not being preached on today. It's not being taught in congregations. In fact, the exact opposite is being taught. You have to love everybody you're commanded to, and, and that's it. I don't want to hear another word about it. Right? But that's not what the Bible is saying. The Bible is saying that God hates people who do certain things. Yep. <laughs> it is very, very clear now go to Psalm chapter 97. 
Psalm chapter 97. So again, you know, uh, I, I, <laughs> I looked at a sermon title and it said, Jesus taught peace and nonviolence and non-hate. And all three of these are connected. Real long title, uh, some, something to that effect. <laughs> Anyways, and I was just thinking about that, you know, and it is so true what these people teach. They say, well, if you hate, then you're automatically a murderer. You're guilty of murder. You know, you should be tried in a court of law. You're not a Christian. You don't have Christ residing in you. And you know what? Nothing could be further from the truth, right? I hate pedophiles. I've hated them since I was a kid. We all hate them. Has anybody in here done any physical harm to one? Now, if they come and attack, that's a different story. I'm going to carry out some righteous justice, all right? But that's a story for another day. Just because you hate someone or something does not necessarily mean that you will commit an act of violence, right? But what do we have today? We have legislatures today. We have uh, laws that are trying to be passed in this nation that say, you know what? Such and such speech is now considered hate speech. If you're caught doing it, you're going to get fined. You're going to go to jail. We're going to kick you off social media or whatever the case is, right? Censorship. And they're using hate to promote that sort of stuff because why? Because God hates them. And God knows that they are against the truth. And we're going to preach the truth and it contradicts the narrative of the world. And so it makes sense that they're going to say, well, hey, we need to get the haters out of here. We need to get all hate out of here. Okay. And, and, and by the way, as many of you know, they're redefining hate every single day because a sodomite can go blow up a building, you know, go blow up a church. And well, that's not hateful. That's just self-defense. You know, that's just the price of doing business. You know, you want to poke the bear or you want to poke the bull, you're going to get the horns. You know, that's the attitude of the world today, which is wicked in and of itself. Psalm 97, look at verse number 10. It says this, ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. So again, why read that? Because if you love the Lord, you need to hate evil. Guess what a loathsome person is? <laughs> An evil person. So are we allowed to hate a loathsome person? Somebody who hates God. Somebody who is Leviticus chapter 20 in its entirety. Or even part of it. Absolutely we are allowed to. And that's what I'm going to spend some time proving. Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. So, by the way, that there in Psalm 97 verse 10 is a commandment. It says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. If you do not love the Lord, I want to tell you right now, it is impossible for you to hate evil. You can sit here all day long and say, well, I hate evil. I hate the evil deeds. You're lying. You're absolutely lying and you're tricking yourself if that's what you think. You have got to love the Lord in order to properly hate evil. Second Chronicles chapter 19. We're going to start reading in verse number one. And so this is a passage here talking about King of Judah uh, and his name was Jehoshaphat. Maybe if you guys were, many of you were here, uh, what? Well, Almost a year ago now, we uh, went through the Old Testament. We talked about a lot of these stories, but I'll just give you a, a brief uh, recap. So at the time of this writing here that this story takes place, the nation of Israel is divided. So you have the southern kingdom of Judah. They have their king. And then you have the northern kingdom of Israel. They have their own separate king, which uh, the capital thereof being Samaria. And during this time, there's a king of Judah named Jehoshaphat. And he had a problem. He had a very big problem. And his problem was hanging out with the kings of Israel. If you know anything about the Old Testament uh, uh, stories here regarding the kings of Israel, they were all wicked, except for Jehu, who we're about to, to read about here momentarily. But uh, they were all wicked. And Jehoshaphat was always willing to put their views and their beliefs aside for the common good of man, if you will. He would be like, you know what, Ahab, I know you hate God. I know you're wicked. But you know what? Your people are as my people. We'll go ahead and join forces and we'll just go smash everybody. And you know what? All that did for Jehoshaphat was bring reproach on him and bring the nation of Judah down in the eyes of God. And so because he was always palling around with Ahab and then after Ahab died, he palled around with his sons and so on and so forth here. And there's going to be a prophet that delivers Jehoshaphat a message about hanging out with wicked people. And I want you to see that here. So look at verse number one, second Chronicles 19, look at verse one. It says in Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah returned to his house in peace 
to Jerusalem. Verse 2, And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him, and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Then he goes on to say, you know, nevertheless, there are some good things about you. And he goes ahead and, and he lists those off. But I want to take a minute here to just break down this verse here. So you have a prophet who, by the way, is from Israel. His name is Jehu. He's, it says that he's a seer. That word there, seer, it means prophet. And he winds up becoming a king here in a, a little while after you read about this. But he goes up to Jehoshaphat and he makes this statement. He said, shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? So he goes up to Jehoshaphat and he asks him a rhetorical question, a question that Jehoshaphat knew the answer to. Okay, you have to understand that. Jehoshaphat knew that what he was doing was wrong. And that's why Jehu puts it to him like this. And so you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the principle behind the question, which is, should we? Should we hang out? Should we associate with people that hate God? And the answer is no, because if God was willing to put his wrath upon King Jehoshaphat, and we in the New Testament are kings and priests, you know, we ought to take a look at that and say, you know what? That's the kind of king I don't want to be like. I don't want the wrath of God on me. And by the way, you wind up hanging out with wicked people, people that hate God, and you start to associate with them. You know what? They might just turn around and rend you. They might just turn around and tear you to pieces. I hear story after story after story of saved, born-again, Bible-believing Christians, independent, fundamental Baptist pastors who allow these wicked people who hate God into the church week after week, week after week. And you know what always happens? Those people wind up molesting somebody or hurting somebody else inside of the church because that is what they are hell-bent on doing. And if you bring a verse like this to them, they'll say this. I don't think that means what you think it means, right? I had a, a pastor one time and he preached a whole sermon against me and, and all of our friends just without naming us. And I went up to him afterwards. I was nice about it. And I quoted him this verse here. And that's exactly what he told me. He said, I don't think that that verse means what you think it means. I said, well, I think it means what it says. I think that if we hang out with those that hate God, we could be inviting the wrath of God upon our lives. What do you think that it means? Yeah. He's out. He got no answer because he's not going back to the Greek because he's King James. He ain't going back to the Hebrew. He can go back to the Chinese or any of those languages. So all he could do was walk away because he doesn't want to believe it. He himself was Jehoshaphat. And you know what? The last thing that I heard about that guy is he lost the church. He's out. He's done. And that thing's being ran by some repent of your sins loser. This is what happens when people neglect the hard teachings in the Bible. Hate is a real thing and we are commanded to hate, but we have to do it within the boundaries that are laid out in the Bible. So you can leave your place there. Go to Psalm chapter 101. Psalm chapter 101. And so I read that to also make this statement here, and that is that hate should be a part of our behavior as Christians. You might be saying, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I've already showed you that it's an attribute that God does have. He hates the wicked, right? Loathsome people, people that hate him, they are wicked. God hates their guts. Like, you know, I mean, this thing is, this is a real doctrine here. Here you have a king who says, you know what? I've got no problems palling around with the world, palling around with those that, that hate God. And God sends him a prophet to rebuke him, to try to straighten him out and says, hey, guess what? The wrath of God is going to be upon you for this. Why are these things preserved? Why are they written down? Why is it all throughout the Bible if we are commanded to not hate anyone for any reason ever? I mean, I think that's a pretty good question. So hate should be a part of our behavior as Christians. But what you have to understand is it has to be a perfect hatred. It has to be a complete hatred within the boundaries laid out in the Bible. Psalm 101, look at verse number two. So it says this, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Look at verse number three. 
I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And then in verse four, he says this, a froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. So what he's saying there is what basically we've been reading since I started preaching the sermon, right? We are not to associate with wicked people, people that are knowingly hating God. And you know what? When we disassociate from those people, you need to understand this, that that is an act of hatred. And that act of hatred is righteous, it's complete, it's just, and it is what God commands His people. Verse 1, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. He goes on to say that he hates the work of them that turn aside. Look, you ought to hate the works of Disney. You ought to hate the works of Hollywood. You ought to hate the works of these artists that blaspheme God every other verse in their songs. You ought to hate that. And because you hate that, when you adopt that philosophy, when you adopt this, this, this testimony, I mean, you know what's going to happen? That sort of stuff, when you hear it in the world, when it gets shoved on you at the grocery store or at work, it's not going to cleave to you. It's not going to cling to you because you have taken the right steps and said, you know what? I'm not going to set a wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. I hate what they do. I hate how they, they purposely sit around and develop and engineer things that are designed to draw God's people away from God and designed to hinder those who would come to God from coming to God. Turn to Psalm chapter 139. Psalm chapter 139. The Bible also says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. And this is why you'll see people as they come into church and they start to be discipled and they start to, to edify one another and get plugged in. You know, you'll start to see that their hatred for the things of the world starts to increase, especially when you go out soul hunting. You'll notice that people start to develop a hatred for dogs. <laughs> I'm just kidding about that, but uh, kind of, not really. I don't know. I like dogs, but I kind of not as much as I used to. Just too much of an excuse. <laughs> oh, I would come and I, I really want to know, but this dog that's like this pig, he won't stop barking and he won't let me come out. Okay. Hate to see you on Judgment Day. Psalm chapter 139. Again, these are familiar verses, but let's read them. Look at verse 19. Psalm 139, look at verse 19. The Bible says this, this is David talking here. He says, Surely thou will slay the wicked. Now let me stop right there and ask you a question. Is that a loving statement? <laughs> is that a February 14th type event? <laughs> no, it's not. It's an October 31st event. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. So you're starting to see a common thread here about those who are wicked, that hate God, that verbalize that, that lets you know that they hate God. We are not to have anything to do with them. Look at verse 21. He says this, Do not I hate them. Well, who is the them there? Yeah, it's the wicked people, the people that we just got done reading about. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Again, a rhetorical question. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? Look at verse 22. This is what I'm talking about here. This is the application. He says, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. You understand? You see now how this is starting to unfold. We are allowed, we are commanded to hate. But we have to do it God's way. We have to do it within the confines that we're given in Scripture. And you know what? Having and developing a perfect hatred, it can take work. You know, when I started, you know, getting back and in, in reading the Bible and, you know, I found preaching that was against the Sodomites, man, I was like, yeah, let's go fight these people physically, you know? And it's like, wait a minute, man, I got to squash this. That's, that's not our fight. We'll talk about that here momentarily, right? You know, that, that's what the world does. That brings reproach. But you know what? It's easy to get those feelings. It's easy to get worked up, you know, especially when they're running their mouths out in the street and they're yelling at us and they think they own the entire neighborhood and the entire complex. You know, it's like, man, I wish that God would just allow me to go, 
and play under Nehemiah's rules. You know, I'd be pulling beards, <laughs> plucking hair. Yeah, I'd be, you know, <laughs> laying hands. But he, he's forbidden that, and so we can't do that. And at least we're honest about how we feel, right? They sit there and they lie and they call the, you know, they call the SPLC or whatever it is, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center. And, oh, I got this church down here and they hate, they hate our people and you need to put them on this list so people know. And please do. <laughs> but nonetheless, in verse 22, he says, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. So what he's saying is those that hate you, God, I count them my enemies. Obviously, David had a lot of enemies in his life. But look at verse 23. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now, let's just stop right here and think about this for a moment. Now, let's say I were to get up here and go outside after the service and go rob a bank. Do you think that I would say, um, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts? I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that, right? Why? Because that is wrong. Why would you want to expose that to God, right? And so the reason why I bring that up is because people, again, they will often say, well, he didn't really mean what he said, right? It meant something different. It was for a different dispensation. Well, that's funny because... <laughs> The word dis dispensation or to dispense means to actually put forth, to, to give. And God's dispense salvation the same <laughs> since the beginning of time. <laughs> All right. So that's definitely not what it's talking about. But he says, I hate them with perfect hatred to count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. So he's obviously not ashamed that he hates God's enemies. I think we can all understand that. I think we can all agree on that, that. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 24. He says this, And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Obviously, getting everlasting life is a free gift today. It was a free gift in David's day. It was a free gift in Adam's day. Salvation has always been free to everybody who wants to receive it. The way of everlasting, it's a way, obviously, after you get saved, there's a certain way that you should conduct yourself, a certain way that you should act, a certain way that you should do things. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me not, or I'm sorry, and lead me in the way of everlasting. So what do we learn from reading that last verse there? That hating those who hate God is not a wicked thing. It's not a wicked thing. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a righteous thing. It's a very good thing. It's something that we are commanded to do. We are commanded to hate God's enemies. We should hate God's enemies. I mean, did not Jehu tell him that? Did not Jehu tell Jehoshaphat that? I mean, you see that principle throughout the entire Bible. If there's no such thing as hate anymore, then why are we reading Matthew chapter 7 and you see that Jesus actually throws people into hell? How come nobody ever wants to explain that? Oh, because, well, you know, you got to go back to the original language and that's actually Hades. And no, that doesn't work. You know better than that. Turn to Ephesians chapter number nine. Ephesians, I'm sorry, nine. Ephesians five, verse 19. <laughs> yeah, turn to Ephesians 19, all right? And if you find it, you got the wrong Bible. <laughs> Ephesians chapter five, Ephesians chapter number five. And so, again, hatred i.e. the perfect hatred, should be part of our behavior as God's children, as Bible-believing Christians. David, a man after God's own heart, was proud, filled with the Holy Ghost, and wrote this psalm here. And of course, uh, many of you have probably heard uh, the idiot, uh, repent of your sins, Bozo, Ray Comfort, um, who had said, you know, this was actually supposed to be David's private prayer language. He's not the only person that I've heard say that. I've heard several Baptist preachers, if you will, say that. That this was not, you know, they'll say, well, this wasn't something that we were supposed to recite or that we were supposed to apply in our day and age. You have to go and you have to study hermeneutics. And this is why hermeneutics are so important, so that you could fit the verse in the right dispensation and blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a big problem with that, and you're going to find the problem with that here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. It says this, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, if we weren't supposed to know this psalm or any of the psalms that we've gone over today, then why isn't there a disclaimer in verse 19? Oh, I'll, I'll just tell you why. It's because all the Psalms are profitable for doctrine, 
for your admonition, for correction, and for reproof and rebuke and, and everything that we need in order to grow in the Christian life. So if somebody says, well, prove to me that it's a righteous thing. Prove to me that it's a good thing to actually hate another human being. You could take them to Psalm chapter 139 and you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, whatever. Well, that doesn't mean that, or that's not for you. That was for David. That was because he was a king and he was going against the bad guys. Or they'll say this, and I've heard this before as well. Well, the Jew is allowed to hate the enemy, but not you. You're not allowed to. Yeah. Right? Gee, I wonder who came up with that doctrine. <laughs> but it's a doctrine, and it's taught in churches today, and you have to know that. You have to understand that. Your next response has to be Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Turn to Colossians chapter number 3. Right? You don't necessarily, you say, oh, I can't remember that. Well, write it down. Write it down, you know, in a little note. Make sure you keep that in your Bible, especially when you're out soul winning, because you never know when you might need this. Right? Because sooner or later, as we go forth into the community, we start to make more waves, people are going to bring this up to you. They're going to say, isn't that that hate church? Isn't your pastor angry? Is he always yelling? Well, you know, we've already had that happen here. You know, they're going to say stuff like that. You have to know how to defend yourself. You have to know how to defend the doctrines of the Bible. And you need to tell them, well, Psalm 139, the whole Psalm, guess what? That's a Psalm. <laughs> It's not top secret. I didn't have to read it backwards in the Hebrew and then do a bunch of magic tricks with numbers and then write it out on a piece of paper to get the true meaning. No, I could just read it for what it is. Yeah. And you know what? We have the full authorization to memorize that and apply that to our lives. Again, just because we hate those who hate God, that doesn't mean we're going to go out on a physical conquest and start blowing people up and fighting them physically and doing harm to them. I've hated them for years, and like I said, I haven't done anything. That's not our fight. That's not our battle. That is not why we were placed on this earth. That's not why God preserves us. And therefore, we have every right to hate those people. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 16. It says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Here's another point that I want to make, like Psalms 139, Psalm 11, I mean, Psalm 101, you know, Psalm 26. I mean, there's all kinds of Psalms. You know what? We could actually put those to music and we could sing those. Amen. And some churches do, and we're going to work on that. We'll, we'll get that going at some point. But you know what? That is biblical. And you know what? That is righteous. And God is more than okay with that. So what I would like to say to the skinny jeans, soy slopping, new evangelical is what do you have to say about that? What are you going to do about that? I'd really like to know. I really want to know your answer. All they're going to do is an about face and walk away from you because this is the Bible. I didn't make any of this up. All I'm doing is just reading it and proclaiming what it says. We have the right to hate with a perfect hatred. It's commanded of us. It's wise. But furthermore, we actually have the right to sing those things. And it is a wonderful thing. Turn to James chapter number five. James chapter number five. Now in James chapter five, it's going to give us a little bit of insight on why you might need to sing a song like that, why we might need to memorize certain psalms like the ones about hate. Psalm chapter 5, look at verse 13. It says this, Is any among you afflicted? Now, is afflicted being, is that, is that a good thing? I mean, is that something that makes you comfortable? No, it's, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's the opposite. So he says, Is any among you afflicted? Well, here is the recipe. Let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. So obviously singing the psalms, if you're happy, it can continue that joy and continue that happiness. But if you're afflicted, you know, he says you can pray. But also if you're afflicted about what the wicked are doing in society, what the wicked are planning on doing, understanding and knowing these psalms and actually singing them, you know what that can do? That can lift your spirits. That can lift your joy because it's that reminder that we all need from time to time that, you know what? God will deal with these people. All that stuff that Biden's doing, and look, Biden ain't doing nothing. 
That guy's a Manchurian candidate. I mean, he's all he is is a pedophile that's out of his mind. He just sits down in a chair. He's got a little earpiece and somebody's like, get up, walk over here, say this, do this. That's it. That's all that bozo does, yeah. you know, but the people that are behind that, the people that are behind him, the ones that you can't see, right? People like Bill Gates who want to fund death in our country and in other countries, you know, people like that, the, 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 the rich people that like to oppress, that bothers us. In fact, that can make you mad if you're not careful. It can not mad like I'm angry. I'm talking like insane, just flip out, just completely gone nuts. And the answer to that obviously is prayer, but it's also understanding the Psalms. It's understanding, you know what? You're not alone. God hates those people as well. And God has a plan for those people and it's okay. In fact, it's great that we know and understand that because that is what will calm us down and relieve that affliction that those people like to um, install in our hearts. Now go to Luke chapter number 14, Luke chapter number 14. I'm going to show you something else about the doctrine of hate here. And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't have love. You just have to do it the right way, the way the Bible teaches. And you need to understand if you pick up a coin, you got two sides, no matter how you look at it. <laughs> you play with heads or tails, you know, sooner or later, guess what? You're going to get that tails and hate is the tails. Luke chapter number 14. What I want to show you now is that Jesus said that we cannot even be his disciples unless we have hate. And I'll show you that here. Luke chapter 14, look at verse 25. It says, And there were great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, is he saying that you should just kill yourself? That you should kneel on a bed of rice, bang your head on the floor? Well, no, because guess what? You're not going to be a very good disciple if you're dead. And if you're constantly whipping yourself like they do in the Philippines and some of these other countries, right? So that can't be what it means. But he says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters, yea, and his own life cannot be my disciple. So what he's saying there is, first of all, when you decide, you know what, I'm going to get sold out. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to follow the Bible. You just have to understand there will be people in your family that look at that and they say, you know what, you hate me because now you don't want to do the things that we used to do, right? You don't want to do the things that I want to do. You want to do all the stuff for church and for God, right? And that's what they'll say. And they'll start to mock you a lot of times. Or if they're saved, but maybe they're not as zealous as you, they may view that still as an act of hate. Like, how come you're not spending time with me? You know, we need to do this on Sunday. We need to do this on Saturday. We need to do this during soul winning time. And you're like, no, I have to go soul winning. I want to go. So I want to edify the brethren or whatever it is. I want to go to church, right? They're going to look at that as a hateful act. And it is a hateful act. But the problem today is that when we hear the word hate, there's like a substance in it. It just kind of lingers in your mind for a minute because you've been brainwashed by the public school, by the media, and just by every facet of society. You know, they have just taught us that when you hear the word hate, you just need to freeze and back up and, oh, we don't hate. Oh, we don't hate, right? But the problem is there's a spectrum of hate. Now, are there people who hate the righteous? Of course. And you know what? A lot of those people, they wind up committing acts of violence against us. And you know what? That's wrong. Just like it's wrong and against the law for us to do that to them, it's wrong for them to do it to us as well. And so you have to understand that just because you hate somebody, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world for them. It doesn't mean, look, I've hated people. I've hated queers since I was a child. And I, oh, I love to bring that up because it's like the one thing I got right in life before I, before I, you know, got saved and all that stuff, you know, I was like, man, at least I never got sucked into that one. You know, I went back and forth on the pre-trib stuff for a while. Well, they're smarter than me. Maybe they're right. You know, but the queer, I was like, no, nah, I'm never giving that one up. Right. So that's like the one thing I'm like, yeah, I got it. But you know what? No one has ever got cancer. No one has ever caught a, a virus or a disease or anything like that because I've hated them. It seems to just kind of stay within me. It doesn't like leap out and become its own entity and go around and kill people. It's fine. It's perfect. So there's a spectrum with hate, right? And that's all he's saying here is, hey, if you want to come after me, you need to put aside worldly things. And that's going to be viewed as an act of hate. 
In fact, if you just look at the word hate in the Bible, there's going to be a lot of verses that kind of read like that. I'll just give you an example. Uh, so in the book of Judges, uh, there was a judge, his name was Jephthah. Well, his brethren, uh, because of reasons of envy, they wound up basically putting him out and getting him out of the house because he had a different mother. He, uh, he was the, the son of a harlot, the Bible says. And as time goes on, they start to get oppressed and they start to realize, you know what? We need to go get Jephthah because he's a mighty man of valor. He's strong. He's a good leader. And we need to get him to help us. And they go to Jephthah and they say, all right, man, we were wrong. We want you to come back and, and lead us into battle. A good idea, right? And he's like, you know, you put, you put me away from you guys. And, 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 now, and he says that you've hated me by putting, you know, by putting me away from you guys. Now, did they kill him? No, because he's there talking and he went on to do, you know, some, some mighty acts in the Bible. But, you know, we have to understand that, that when you put people away from you, that's an act of hate. For example, another example here, uh, in, in Jude, it says that the events that happened uh, to Sodom and Gomorrah, that those are an example, right? And you say, well, how, how do we follow that example today? Well, we have nothing to do with them. We don't allow them to come into church. We don't, we don't allow them into our lives. We don't associate with them. Right? And guess what? That's an act of hate. And that is great. That is okay. Does that kill them? Does that cause them disease? Does that cause them, you know, cancer or anything like that? Do they drop over dead? No. So why is it trying to be pushed as a legal matter today? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because the evil ones that run society, they understand this doctrine. They understand the damage that they can do. And so therefore they say, you know what? That's a good tool. That's a good weapon. We need to force them to be able to go into every business, every church, everything, because they'll just destroy it all. And then we can just start over and have our great reset that we want. Turn to, turn to Matthew chapter number five. And so all I'm saying is that hate is, could be, I mean, boiled down to even just as simple as not wanting to have anything to do with someone else. I mean, think about it. If you don't want to have anything to do with me, just constantly ignore me. Yeah, I get out of here. You know, I don't want to talk to you. Well, it's, it's a hateful act. <laughs> No matter how you look at it, it's a hate flag. Now, am I going to keel over dead for it? No. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, that is a hateful act. Now, Matthew chapter 5, I say, okay, I get it. The Bible commands us to hate. How do we do that appropriately? I understand what perfect hatred is. I understand what that means to, to have a complete hatred. we got to hate the right people for the right reasons. But how do we apply that? How do we actually do that? And you're going to see that here in these coming verses. Matthew 5, look at verse 43. Jesus says this, he says this, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. And here's where everybody stops. See this? They'll say this. This is where Jesus changed all that stuff about hate in the Old Testament, right here. Well, you know that passage that we read about in Luke just like a few minutes ago? That if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brethren, i.e. making them lower priority than God, then you can't be my disciple. Remember how Jesus said that? You know what? The NIV even says that. So there's no getting out of this for the new evangelical because their modern versions say hate. I mean, they changed the rest of it up, but it does say hate. So you need to think about that and remember that when they challenge you on this. See, even your own book, your own Bible version, if you will, your watered down garbage NIV, NASB piece of junk Bible, which isn't a Bible, it's more of a sorry commentary, actually says that, I mean, it actually has this, this, the same wording in Luke chapter 14 that we just read to you, which is a commandment to hate. But anyways, it says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now, whose enemies are we talking about here? It says thine enemy, so your personal enemies here. In verse 44, it says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And we believe all of that, and we preach all of that, and we need to do all of that. But turn to Romans chapter 12, because people will say, well, see, this is where Jesus changed everything, like Psalm 139, Psalm 11, Psalm 26, Psalm 101, and all the other Psalms that are about hate. And they'll say, see, he changed all of that. Well, hold on, not so fast. Why do we do those things? Why is Jesus saying this? Because remember, he's preaching to these people. He's doing miracles. You know, he's starting to make waves and people are saying, wow, there's our king. He's going to come back and establish the kingdom, right? Remember when we went through uh, uh, John, how we were always, you know, seeing the disciples are like, are you going to set up the kingdom now? Right? Even in the beginning of Acts, like, you going to set up the kingdom now? Right? They were thinking physical kingdom, like we're going to have like, like King David back on the throne and we're going to mop everybody in the world up. Well, Jesus is preparing the people here and saying, hey, 
It's not like that anymore. You guys are going to get dispersed. You're going to be forced to live amongst crooked and perverse governments and people and so on and so forth. And so the recipe has to change because you have to follow their laws. That's, that's basically what he's saying. Because guess what? You say, well, we'll go ahead and prove it. Well, what about the millennium when he comes and rules and reigns with a rod of iron? Are we going to, in the millennium, just be like, oh, you're, you're a good little faggot. You're, you're a good little queer. I, I mean, I'm just going to pray blessings. I know he's going to get mopped badly is what's going to happen. And you know that's true. But in the time being, we are no longer a physical nation. We are a spiritual nation. The nation of Israel, if you will, God's chosen people is made up of those who have been born again, born into his family and are saved forever. And because we're scattered throughout the entire world, we have to function differently than they did in the Old Testament. And so this is why Jesus mentions this here in Matthew chapter number five. He says, hey, you've heard that you should hate your enemy, right? You tell that to an Old Testament Hebrew and they're like, all right, well, the Canaanites, let's go whack their heads off. You know, you tell that to David and he's going to get the saws out and he's, let's go. I'll hack anybody. Let's, you hate God, I'll kill you. And you know, he would do that. You do that. I mean, heck, Jehu, right? You guys remember what Jehu did to the prophets of Baal? Yep. I mean, <laughs> we, who would love to see something like that, right? We can't do that kind of stuff because we don't have a physical sovereign nation like they had. And Jesus is preparing the disciples. He's preparing the people that are there for the coming change. But even in doing all the stuff that we just read about in Matthew 5, about praying for those who despitefully use us and all of that stuff, I want to show you why he has us do this. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 17. So Paul tells the Romans this. He says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And we should do that with everybody, right? But the reason why he says, if it be possible, is because he knows that it is not always possible. But nonetheless, we should try, right? When we see the alphabet people, we stay away from a mouse winning. Like when it's like it's obviously, you know, they're walking around and they got the brony shirt and you know and the the the, the queer fag shirt and all that stuff and, and and it's like okay, you know, they're holding hands with it. You know, it's like look, I'm not even going to approach you, right? That that that's fine. We're trying to live peaceably with all men because we cannot do anything and we should not do anything. Look at verse 19. He says this, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So we have to understand that in the day and age that we live in, we need to give place to wrath because you will be filled with wrath, you will be filled with hate. But again, it's how you manage that hate that makes the difference. We need to give ours to God. We need to read the Psalms. We need to know the end. We need to know what God says about these people because that will relieve our affliction and allow us to be able to function getting people saved and preaching the gospel, which is our priority. That is our mission. Look at verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So even when we do all of these nice things to the people that hate our guts, it's still a hateful act. I mean, is heaping coals of fire on somebody's head a loving act? Is that a February 14th thing? Oh, I get it. In the original language, he was talking about taking cinnamon hearts, which can be kind of hot, right? Or those hot tamale candies and putting them on somebody's head and giving them a treat. Stupider things have been said. <laughs> I haven't heard that. I just made that up because I, I just get carried away sometimes. But look at verse 21. He says this, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And so this is how we conduct ourselves with the emotion of hate. We follow these principles. We keep it within the guidelines of the Bible. That way the world can't come and say, oh, you know, you guys have killed thousands of people, blah, blah, blah. They can't do that. They can't say that. And if they do say that, we know that they are lying. And we can teach those who are hanging in the balances, hey, look, wake up. Wake up. They're lying to you. We haven't done any of that stuff. We followed this. But it should give us some satisfaction that when we do these things to those that hate our ever-loving guts, that we're heaping coals of fire on their head. And that's a good thing. That is how we deal with wrath. Now, we're getting close to being done here, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 10. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you basically how and, and, and why very few Christians today are actually in the fight. You know, I, I had somebody recently he was like, you know what, the reason why I'm going to the church that I'm going to now is because I could get plugged in, man, and I'm in the fight. And I'm like, great, what are you doing? He's like, oh, man, I'm, I'm developing like these little products to, to hand out to, to kids and stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. What else? Well, I, I, um, we're starting a, a small group. And actually, my wife's starting a small group, too. I'm like, a small group, huh? I'm like, man, so you're really fighting the battle, huh? That is awesome, right? And inside, I'm like, I got to get out of here before I flip. But <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, look at verse number 4. It says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning not physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, and we will, uh, we'll, we're going to finish up here in a minute. I like this statement here. For our weapons are not carnal, right? I'm not against having uh, rifles, pistols, any of that stuff. I've got them. I'm, you know, going to keep them. I ain't giving them up. You know, hopefully you got your swords and stuff. Hopefully you have more than two, <laughs> okay? And that's an inside little joke there. But uh, <laughs> he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So again, right, how do we use our weapons? Well, in regards to those who hate us, Romans chapter 12, right? Matthew chapter number 5. Right? We're going to pray for those who despitefully use us and those that want to, to talk trash, that God's will would be done in their lives because we don't know all the time exactly what's going on with them. A lot of times it seems like people hate God, but in reality they don't. They're just angry. They've, got, they've you know, had a rough life. And then later on down the road, they, you know, they, they may soften up. But he says, but our weapons are still mighty. Okay? And here's the thing that you have to understand. We, need, we are in a war. And guess what? That war's not fought by starting small groups on Wednesday nights. That's, that, that war is not fought by making little Christmas trees out of wood and going around and handing them out with a bag of lemon heads to kids. Okay, that is not fighting a battle. He says that our weapons that we use today, that they are mighty and they are strong, and we have to understand that. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 10. So Paul, along the same lines, he says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we are commanded to be strong. Why? Because we are in a war. And guess what? When there is war, there is an enemy. And when there's enemies, there's hatred. Starting to see that now? But we have to manage that hatred. We have to execute our hatred within the confines of the Bible. Verse 11, he says this, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil. So we understand that the devil has a lot of wily tricks. He's crafty, he has new ways of saying things, takes the same doctrines and spins them around and puts it in a different phrase. And then it's like, wait a second, you have you scratching your head like, wait, what did that guy just say? Sounds like he means repent of your sins, but I can't tell. You know, you ever had that happen to you? And you're, now you're left like, Something doesn't seem right. I just can't put my finger on it. Then you go back and you go, oh, okay, that's what he meant. You know, it's, it's the new saying. Well, that is an act of the devil. That's what he does. And the way that we respond to that and deal with that is by using the word of God and putting on the whole armor of God. That's why we preach about this so often. Verse 12, he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know what, and just about every company or uh, government organization is a person of high, uh, high esteem. And you know what, a lot of times those people are very wicked. Those people hate our guts and they want to do certain things to us. And they want to pass laws that basically prohibit us from preaching the truth and going out in the community and spreading the gospel. But look at verse 13, he says, Wherefore, so for that reason, because there is war waged against us, he says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And that should be the goal for all of us, right? The goal should be at the end of your life that you did all that you could to stand, meaning you subscribed to the word of God, you took these precepts, you did them, and you learned to hate every false way that's out there. Verse 14, he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. 
I say this all the time because I'm mad and it is so true, but these churches today in this country and in the world, by and large, they don't have their loins girt about with truth. They have pilot syndrome and they'll say, well, what is truth? Yeah. Right? Well, the, we have to look to the scholar because the truth is ever changing. We have to wait and see what gets dug up and what gets translated. And then we go from there and that's how we learn our truth. But the Bible says something vastly different, that we have the ability to gird our loins with the truth, which is the word of God and with all truth. You know, with all truth. People say, oh, you're just a conspiracy church. You don't think there are conspiracies out there? Right? I mean, we believe in the truth, and you know what? The truth does set you free. Amen. It makes you free. It is wise to learn the truth about different things. I mean, think about how many people right now are falling over dead. I hear about it every single day, people taking the vaccine. I was in a house this morning, and the guy's like, hey, my wife is a nurse at the hospital over here at St. Al's, and she just got her second dose. He's telling me all these symptoms. I mean, she's bouncing off the walls after the first one, dizzy. And like, I'm seeing this all over town. And he's like, I'm just glad she hasn't dropped over dead yet. I was like, yeah, me too. You know, and he's like, are you going to take it? I was like, heck no. He's like, I'm not either. Like, she's trying to force me, but I don't want to take it, man. And I'm just hoping she doesn't die. He's like, because she's telling me about people that she knows here in Idaho that have died taking that. Well, you know what? That, in understanding that truth, like, hey, um, putting a bunch of unclean things that aren't even <laughs> tested, you know, in, into our bodies, you know, that's not wise. That's the opposite of true. So you see, all truth is what we need to gird our minds with because it saves us. Look, if we all just throw caution to the wind and just forget about truth, you can, we're all going to make stupid mistakes, stupid things are going to happen to us, and then we're out of the fight. And then we lost the battle, and we're going to lose the war. But he says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. How do you get that righteousness? Well, you get it from God. And when you understand that it's a gift from God, you know what? That is a precept that you have down pat, and therefore you will begin to hate you will begin to hate the false way, the human achievement way, the way that says, no, it's not that simple. You have to work for it. And you know what? When we hear people preaching that false doctrine, you're going to hate them as well because they hate God. Right. Look at verse 15. It says, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And again, this is that the gospel of peace of the world, which goes around and says, hey, peace be unto you. And that's it, right? No, this is, hey, you can cease from your works. They're not profiting you anything. Jesus paid it all, and you can trust in that. That is the gospel of peace. Verse 16, he says this, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That is, that is our church's verse, Amen. right? And we do that. And, you know, in churches like ours, they do that. They take that faith, which is a shield, and go out and block the darts of the wicked and use the sword to get people saved, to cut through the deception and the lies and the hatred, the real hatred against God that is sown in the minds and hearts of people all over this community. Verse 17, he says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is what overwhelmingly the majority of Christendom today lacks what they do not have. They, you, if you run into somebody, they got an NIV. They do not have a sword. They've got like a butter knife at best or one of those rubber training knives. And, and it's, it's the one that breaks real easy. It's not even the plastic one like Mauser has. Because at least the plastic one that he has could still hurt you. You know, the NIV isn't going to hurt anybody except for people who are saved. Look at verse 17 again. He says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So why have all of this armor? Why have a weapon if we don't have an enemy to fight? Because we do have an enemy to fight, and we need to hate what they do, and we need to hate that enemy and conduct warfare properly. Right? Our weapons are not carnal, meaning we don't run to the pistol, to the rifle, to do the work of the kingdom. We run to this book right here and we use that. We fire these darts into the community and we watch what happens. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all pre uh, perseverance and supplication for all saints. And so I just wanted to read that just to kind of leave that fresh in your mind, you know, we have a war going on today and we have 
the instructions. We have the standard operating procedures and how to go and conduct battle, right? The Bible tells us, hey, just because you're to love your enemies and you're to pray for them who despitefully use you in all of these things, you know, doesn't mean that you're not in a fight. It doesn't mean you're not in a war. You need to develop that hatred, keep it within the confines that are in the Bible, and use your weapons the right way. That is how we use hate. And you know what? That doesn't physically harm anyone. But the media today is, you know, saying something vastly different. Oh, we got to do something about these hateful extremists, right? Every house that I go into today that has the news on, I don't even have to look at the screen. It's this. It's extremism, extremist, extremism, extremist. That's all they're talking about. Terrorist, extremist. And guess what? They're not talking about your neighborhood uh, Islam factory. <laughs> you know, they're not talking about that mosque over there on Lake Hazel and Cloverdale. They're talking about churches like this who get up and will preach something like this, who will get up and say, you know what? You can't work your way to heaven. You have to be forgiven. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is hateful to the world because they say, no, 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 that excludes other people. Well, too bad because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is what it is. That's the truth. That's part of our sword. And if we have to take that out into the community and start you know, wheeling that thing around, which we will and which we do, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. They could say all day long, well, that's a hateful act, blah, blah, blah. You know in your heart that is your mission statement. That is what we do. And that's what gets results. Not starting the small groups, not saying, oh, you shouldn't hate anybody for any reason. Because we saw tonight quite the opposite. And so I'll leave you with this where we first started. David said, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. And God looked and said, you know, that is a right statement. That is a righteous statement. That is what we need to live by here. It's okay to hate the congregation of the wicked evildoers that are out there because you know what? Time is running short. They aren't doing us any favors. And by pretending that you love them and that you're going to help them out and build them a house and give them money and roll the red carpet out for them, all that's going to happen to you is they will turn around and rend you into pieces, disable you and take you out of a fight. All because you, ne you completely neglected the truths that are inside of this book here. You know, hate, all that is, is the opposite of love. We are allowed to hate. We are commanded to hate. We just have to do it the right way, the way that God said to do it. And you know what? He's pleased with us. We don't care what other people think at that point because he will be magnified in our bodies and everyone else can go to hell. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, again, for delivering uh, so much truth to us week after week, Lord, from your word. Just pray that uh, you be with us as we go uh, the rest of the week and, um, go out soul winning lord and we go out and we we bring the sword to the community lord we just pray that uh you'd help us to uh not miss an opportunity to get those in the community that uh, that would be saved saved just pray you bless the fellowship after the service lord and again we thank you for the safety that you've provided us week after week in jesus name i pray amen